Hey guys, welcome back to another one of CCA's interview, which is part of our outreach series. For those who don't know, my name is Aaliyah. I am a CCA intern and a graduate at St. Peter's University in Jersey City, New Jersey, where I recently received my bachelor's in biology, aspiring to work in the medical field. I too was born with a facial difference called Golden Heart Syndrome that came with a long road of surgeries, therapies, and a lot of rehabilitation. But as you already know, it never stopped me from achieving any of my goals. So today I am joined with Dr. Daniel Lamb, Dr. Lamb is a general pediatrician at Loma Linda University Children's Hospital. Dr. Lamb is also the medical director of the cranial facial team as well. Welcome, Dr. Lamb. It is a pleasure to have you on our series. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you for joining and sharing your time with us. How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. Yeah. Yeah, I got the morning morning off, but I'll be going into work this afternoon. Oh, what's your hours for today? Uh just the afternoon clinic. Um we have a. Uh, uh, cranial facial clinic this um to see some new patients uh and a few return patients as well Ooh, okay so like how i mentioned and talked about you know, a little bit about yourself in the beginning from your perspective can you tell us about yourself and explain your profession <laughs> um so i am a general pediatrician um if you think of who you went to for your physicals or what we call wellness checks when you were younger mm -hmm. and uh, and got your vaccines and your checkup, um, that's that's what I do. Um, and, uh, you know, see patients for sick visits as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, working at an academic center, um, uh, it's, I think, often the case that you wear a few different hats. Um, so in addition to being in a, a general pediatrician in a, in a typical pediatrics clinic, I'm also a, a pediatrician for the craniofacial team center at Loma Linda University Children's Hospital, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of the team-based clinics throughout the country are uh, approved by the American Cleft Palate and Craniofacial Association, ACPA. Mm -hmm. And part of their guidelines um, is that they have access to a general pediatrician. Um, and so oftentimes a general pediatrician is part of the team clinic. Uh, the way things that have the way things have been set up at Loma Linda um, is that a general pediatrician has been uh, the team director. I think it's just because we, uh, when it was organized, it fell under the umbrella of the Department of Pediatrics. Um, so I believe it's a little unusual to have a general pediatrician as the medical director of the clinic. Um, but uh, but that's the way we, we've set things up. And um, yeah, I, so what I do as part of the team is I help, um, as the ACPA would put it, optimize. Uh, the care, uh, I manage, help manage the care of our patients as it pertains to their craniofacial condition mm -hmm. uh, and ensure that they're getting all the care and other services they need uh, and that there's nothing interfering with their ability to get their care. Um, so different outside specialists or therapies or you know any surgeries that are upcoming. Um, and I do am able to do that because of all the other team members on the team. I wear a couple other different hats, um, maybe one to two months out of the year, uh, or for a week at a time. I do inpatient medicine, and that's on a general pediatric ward. So okay. if you get admitted for you know, having a little trouble breathing, or um, you have an infection that requires antibiotics to an IV, mm -hmm. um, you know those are the type of patients I see in the hospital. And a few times a month, um, I go to a clinic uh, for patients with neuromuscular conditions, primarily cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. uh, they, um, so that, that I, I see them once a year so that I can sign their orders for physical and occupational therapy uh, or uh, different braces or wheelchairs or other equipment they need. Right. Um, so those are the primary, the primary roles I have. So a few different hats that I wear. Oh, wow. And how long have you been a general pediatrician for? I um, started my residency in 2011, and that's three years of uh, uh, 
for their training and work after medical school. And then I finished my residency in 2014. So as of a couple months ago, uh, 10 years. 10 years. Oh, wow. I don't know if I've ever told you, but before um, I was in, well, before I graduated uh, college, uh, when I was a freshman in college, that was one of my goals to become a, uh, it was either a general pediatrician or a plastic surgeon for the craniofacial team. But, um, you know, things change, different interests, but it still stays, you know, you know, lives in rent free in the back of my mind, like, oh, maybe, 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 you know. <laughs> but um, my big question for you is what inspired you to work in the medical field? Uh, first, it was uh, my own experiences mm -hmm. and um, my fam, and then my parents uh, and how they encouraged me to be engaged in my care from a very early age. Right. And as I got older, the, uh, the experiences that they told me about caring for a child with a craniofacial condition. So I think those two things, my own experiences and, right. and the encouragement and experience of my parents were what got me interested in the medical field, specifically uh, pediatrics or, or in some way working with kids. Oh, wow. that's, uh, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. pretty interesting because, you know, how you say from your own experience, you know, we both have Gordon Hart syndrome. And <laughs> I remember the times that I despised going to the hospital for appointment visits and everything for surgeries, therapies, and everything. And, uh, you know, to hear you say like, oh, like from your experience, was it from like a good, like, did you have a good experience with the hospital growing up or was it such a, you know? I mean, I've, uh, I, I grew up, well, from five onward uh, yeah. with the training facial team at Loma Linda. So right. uh, I went, I did I didn't know I'd would have the opportunity to be part of the team, but right. I did go. I did go back to their work eventually. Um, so yeah, and that was largely in part because that's where my interest in medicine started, right. and because of the um, the good ex the good experience I had as a, as a member of that team and uh, and a few uh, particular physicians and dentists uh, who who made that insurgents who made that experience. Uh, a fantastic one. Got you. Got you. You know, I know you had to go through what you mentioned. You had to go through residency. You had to go through a whole bunch of other classes and a whole bunch of other courses. Out of all throughout your journey, what was the hardest part of becoming a doctor? Uh, a lot of challenges along the way. Right. Um, and really, the journey starts uh, from the moment you become interested uh, in. Or, or decide to become a physician uh, or a surgeon. So for me, that began the junior year of high school is right. when I uh, decided that I'll be pre-med when I get to college. Right. Um, so uh, I was had the fortune of starting then and in college being able to shadow a couple of physicians in their clinics, starting some volunteer, uh, with some volunteer activities that were within the, the medical field, um, but then in college, having to take uh, pre-med classes, uh, so biology, chemistry, physics, um, and I think those were that was that was the hardest part school was. <laughs> um, and then when uh, starting um, third year of medical school, you're pretty much full time either right. in the hospital or clinic, and uh, especially when you're in the hospital, that can uh, be some really long hours and that continues over into residency right um so yeah and I, I would say that may be the most challenging or the uh the the long hours that that you put in as part of your training whether that's uh, studying or mm -hmm. on site in in the hospital right right and i uh I applaud you on that because not not everyone can, you know, have the dedication to do that, you know. So I give you all your praise and your flowers for everything you do, you know. It's, 
throughout your journey for every patient out there because you know and even for a representation for the facial difference community you know it's not just yeah. representation and a lot of career roles especially in the medical so I know you're doing amazing work and you know to has that ever happened like have you ever dealt with the case with someone who had a child with going heart syndrome before yes uh I did to your point though uh what you were saying previously I think people can and do surprise themselves with what they're capable of always um yeah so I hope like the long hours or the grueling training doesn't uh uh dissuade people from right entering the medical field because there's so many they're capable of more than they realize and there's so many fulfilling things about it uh as for um caring for individuals with golden heart syndrome yes yeah we have a number of patients in our clinic with with golden heart or or similar um yeah. uh conditions it's golden heart is a, a collection a, essentially a collection of different different findings um and shared characteristics but there's there's other conditions very similar to that too uh yeah. altogether though they are they are pretty rare um the first time <laughs> i met anyone with golden heart syndrome except maybe very briefly in my craniofacial clinic i think there was, i remember seeing uh one kid uh much younger than me who had golden heart but he, and he was very shy um so i didn't get to talk to him but other than that, I did not meet anyone else with Golden Heart Syndrome until my uh, fourth year of medical school, um, oh. when there were a couple patients on uh, the rotation I was on. And so I got to speak to their families. Um, and then there was one other patient a couple months later on a different rotation. And then after that, not, I don't think... Uh, I met anyone else until I started working at the craniofacial clinic at Loma Linda. And how does that make you feel like working, like, you know, interacting with your first family or child with Gordon Heart Syndrome? Because I feel like, ooh, I feel like everything will start to come back. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're me. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it's, I definitely feel it. Uh, I perhaps feel it more with the families who, whose kids do have, have golden heart syndrome. Um, the, uh, the connection there and right. the shared experience. Um, right. but I find I'm also able to make that connection with, with the other families and patients in our clinic who, who have, um, medical conditions other than golden heart syndrome, yeah. uh, because the, there are a lot of shared experiences. Uh, yeah. uh, the specific medicine and the surgeries have, have largely changed over time. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, but still we, we have often have surgeries. We have medical appointments that we have to go to when, right. and then uh, outside of medicine, when we're at school or in the community, we got, excuse me, uh, uh, yeah, we get questions, um, from people, uh, so because of that, uh, I'm able to connect with, with the patients. And then uh, because of everything my parents and siblings told me about their experiences uh, with me growing up um, and with my parents helping to care for me, uh, I think that has really helped me connect with the parents as well. So yeah, we're able to make that connection. We can, um, uh, because of that shared experience, but, uh, but everyone is different too often make sure that you know the family knows that when when i do talk about my experience when that does come up in conversation when the parents ask i'm willing to share but i do highlight that everyone's experience is different right. um and so because uh, i don't want to provide a sense of uh, a sense that everything's going to happen for their kid exactly as it happened for me um it's going whether, to okay. in the positive and negative ways you know right i don't want to um uh, I want them to ensure that, yeah, they definitely reach out to the community of that uh, uh, the internet and clinics make possible. Uh, but just know your kids, it's going to be a little different for everyone. Right, right. I love how you describe that because um, 
I feel like as I'm still, you know, going through, you know, my appointments and surgeries and everything, you know, um, to have to like have someone like have you as a doctor and for you to, you know, share, you know, some of your experience to the families, but, you know, still say like, you know, this worked for me, but this is not going to, it may not work for your child because going hard can come up in any type of cases and everything and everyone's different in their own way. And um, I feel like it's so important for um, the medical field or, you know, professions like you to um, have an opinion and just, you know, connect with families and not even with families, even with the children. Because for me, and I can I feel like I could speak for any other patient that has a facial difference that is it is kind of hard to to always go off what, you know, the doctors say and everything and um to follow through and everything. They don't understand, you know, they don't have the facial difference. So like when they say like, oh like okay, this is the next step. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do this and this and this. And it's like, oh my gosh, like this is so much. This is this is insane. Like I'm gonna put my body through this mentally and physically. What what's going to happen? And um it's just so soothing to like I I know I'm like like kind of dragging this, but like it is so amazing to have you in the in the medical field because it's just a lot of patients we go through, you know, medical trauma and go through this and everything. So just to have you there, it just makes it 10 times so much better. And I'm so glad we're doing this interview because I know a lot of people that watch the series, you know, will are wanting to learn the inner workings of the hospital and wanted to hear your side, you know, having a facial difference and working in the medical field and how it's like. And that leads me to my next question. Um, how has it been to be in this field but with a facial difference? Have you seen any like challenges or people treating you differently or has there been any, nothing? Like, let me know the team, <laughs> put me on, what's going on? I feel like I've really only ever been treated as a colleague. Okay, good, good. And I think uh, our our team is, is very much that, a team okay. with uh, several working parts that uh, support each other. Um, and uh, particularly our our surgeons are very experienced caring for children with craniofacial conditions. Right. And um, and through working with those patients and their families over the years, have uh, they're they're very knowledgeable about what these uh, kids are going through. Yeah. Uh, just as the surgeons I had. Uh, Growing up, or also largely experienced caring for kids with craniofacial conditions and understanding of the challenges they were going through, and and willing to to listen to what some of those challenges were. Right. Um, but it's it is very much a, a a team effort with the nurses, speech pathologist, social worker. Right. Let me see if I can list everyone: plastic surgeon, dentist, orthodontist, uh, geneticist, genetic genetic counselor. Medical assistants. What else have we got on our team? Ear, nose, and throat doctors or otolaryngologists. Yeah. Uh, for some of our patients, neurosurgeons, developmental psychologists, dietitians. Mm -hmm. And I apologize to anyone on my team watching this that I may have left out, but I think that's most everyone. Just doing the mental inventory in my head, real quick. Yeah. It's a whole but it, but it is a very much a team effort. It, all yeah. of our patients have different. Uh, different challenges that um require each of often require each of our expertise um and so we we definitely support each other that way uh but coming back to you know having a facial difference on the team um i think largely that factors into my uh interaction with patients um right. but you know the few times it's come up where i share my experiences with with my colleagues um mm -hmm. the other members of the team uh that they've definitely been willing to to and uh we've been willing to and have encouraged you know, me sharing those experiences 
Right. Oh, wow. It's pretty cool. That, that's so cool. And um, since we know the doctor side of Dr. Lamb, what do you like to do on your free time? What's the re who is who is Mr. Daniel Lamb? Who who is he? We want to know. <laughs> Well, I, uh, as I think a lot of us in the healthcare field, uh, I, I, th I think we would feel the same way. Um, you know, large because of how much time we've committed to the medical field, that that does make up a good bit of our identity. Right. It does. Um, yeah, you know, fielding questions at, uh, uh, family or friend gatherings <laughs> kind of about medical ailments kind of comes with the territory. So there's, there's always that part of being a doctor that you can't or, or anyone else in the healthcare field that you can't really turn off. Yeah. Right. And we do that to each other too. Sometimes there are times where I ask the speech pathologists about, you know, an issue not related to our patients about speech or feeding and swallowing. So, mm -hmm. um, Yeah, so all of us, I think that does form a good part of our identity. All our family and friends know that we work in the healthcare field. and um, But outside of that, mm -hmm. um, I do have a, a, a number of interests. I, uh, my biggest hobby is uh, collecting recorded music. Um, I'm still waiting for the CD renaissance that is supposed to happen in a year now. Uh, but I, you know, audio files, I hope they don't, uh, come at me for saying this, but I don't notice the difference between vinyl and CDs and uh. CDs are cheaper. So, uh, so I do collect CDs. I probably, I would think have a few thousand in my collection and that's, what's blurred out behind me is, uh, uh, a lot of, uh, recorded music on the shelves there. Um, and for the, the artists or bands that I'd like, uh, trying to, collect uh not absolutely everything they've put out but at least yeah. all the, the song the songs and albums they put out um but no i enjoy spending time with family and friends and uh i enjoy uh movies um and and a few tv shows i also i almost said films but um what kind of movie I'm not, that, I'm not that knowledgeable about movies so i didn't want to sound pretentious mm -hmm. uh of all types and And really, that's with my music or with my reading, too. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's uh, not any one particular genre I gravitate towards normally. I mean, that is... But um, but I know what I like within within each of those. I'm willing to to, uh, uh, to listen, and there's usually, you know, uh, at least one or two artists out of that genre that I end up uh, uh, really liking. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know... Give me a Disney Pixar movie, and that's probably going to make my favorites list. Yeah. <laughs> same, same. I don't care how old I am. I will always pick a list from the Disney movies. Always. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But same, when it comes to music, I literally gravitate to so much. And I recently, lately, have been gravitating towards, like, some classic old music, like, Let me let me say some names like oh we were at the retreat and we did the um the Mona Lisa and you did a reference with Nat King Cole. I was like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, like I love him. Like th those are the people I listen to. Like Nat King Cole, Bing Cosby, like I'm starting to, you know, get into it. those um music and I love it. Like it's so soothing. Yeah. The voice is just perfection. I'm like, oh my gosh, this, this is my era. This, this is, I should have been born during this time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I will listen to, yeah, anything by Nat King Cole. Yeah, um, grew up with his Christmas album, uh, or albums, I mean, there's a couple that have collected all his Christmas recordings. Oh, wow. Um, so yeah, so that voice is very, uh, yeah, I just love his voice, um, I just can't even describe it. It's so unique and it's just there's something to the soul, which you already know. So <laughs> oh, yeah. okay. My last question for you, Dr. Lamb, is what advice would you offer someone who is considering working in the medical field? Whether um 
they have a facial difference, they don't have a facial difference. If you could, I would say, like, speak on both sides, but we're all the same. But, like, you know, people with facial difference, you know, they, you know, tend to, you know, get discouraged because, you know, it's just a, you know, a broad field and, you know, you're interacting with patients and everything and you know some people might are still doing still dealing with you know self-love and you know just self-reflecting and everything so what advice can you give to the facial difference community I think the kind of the, the underlying advice I would give would be to remember the why and uh, why you're going into the medical field or what's driving you to go into the medical field. And that why may change over time. Um, for me, it was wanting to um, bring to the medical field uh, the perspective that I had, not a lot of whether it's facial difference or something else, not a lot of patients go well, I guess we're all patients in some ways, but in terms of patients with chronic medical conditions, not a lot of us go into the medical field and bring that experience. So I felt it was important to do that and to um, one why that developed over time that also motivated me is wanting to empower the parents or other caregivers for kids to be as much a part of the healthcare team as anyone else. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, so as a general pediatrician, it's it's my one of my roles and something uh, uh, I'm given to time to do in my encounters with patients and their families mm -hmm. is to provide some of that education um, to, to, again, empower them to be a part of the care team. So uh, those are, I think, a, a couple of my whys and uh, what continue to propel me even though even when things got hard uh throughout my medical training mm -hmm. um so remembering that why allowing it to develop over time and what develops and and i th i think sometimes that may it, it may mean uh kind of switching switching tracks uh and pursuing something else um whether that's something else within the same medical degree or hopping over into a different role Right. Um, as I uh, kind of inferred earlier, there's so many different, on a craniofacial team, there's so many different types of people um, yeah. with different kinds of training who are essential to providing uh, the care that our patients need. Mm -hmm. And that's not just within craniofacial medicine, that's within medicine in general. Um, you know, even, even in places that aren't defined specifically yet teams, even in a general pediatrician's office, even on the general pediatric ward, right. there really is, you know, we are working together yeah. as all the different specialists are working together as a team to help care for, for a patient. So, um, so if you have an interest in medicine, but you find over time that becoming a physician and surgeon may not be right for you or um, becoming a nurse uh, may not be right for you. I mentioned those because those are kind of the more, when people think of the medical field, that uh, I think they're those are often what they're thinking of. But again, if they're interested in medicine, but they don't feel that those roles are necessarily right for them, there's really a broad spectrum of uh, a lot of different opportunities um, yeah. to continue to work within the medical field and serve patients that aren't that aren't necessarily the the doctors and and nurses that we typically think of when when we th uh, that that people may typically think of when they think of the medical field. Um. So remembering the why of being open to doing uh, the to the uh, to the possibility that you, what you think you may do at the beginning may not be uh, where you end up at the end of your journey. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I didn't know I have again have the opportunity uh, to be involved in craniofacial medicine, and I'm very fortunate that, um, that the uh, uh, colleagues and uh, and uh, supervisors at Loma Linda um, gave me that opportunity. Um, but yeah, I wasn't sure when I when I was going through my medical training. Sure, I knew I wanted to be a pediatrician and I was sticking with that. But I thought I was going to subspecialize like in neonatal medicine or 
or a different specialty, but then I just decided on on general pediatrics and right. Um, and even then, that I mentioned some of the different hats I wear. You know, I didn't necessarily have any of those in mind. I didn't know they were possibilities when I was starting out in medicine. So, so yeah. I think that's a long winded answer to your question, but uh, remembering the why and being open to um, the why changing over right. time, and that that may influence. Um, you know, changes in your your path along the way to entering the medical field. And that is so important. I love how you say remembering the why, because that's how it was all started. The why, 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 why. I think I needed to hear that too today. <laughs> and well, I know. That's always good advice. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, you're telling me. And I feel like once you, like you said, once you figure out the why, you start to propel, you start to, you know, I feel like you start to plan more, you start to have a sense of, you know, what's the next step, you know, and that's where it all leads to dedication, discipline, and, you know, just encourage yourself mentally, you know, to push yourself there, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing I wish, um, advice I wish I had heeded earlier on, uh, and make sure to, uh, I, I would encourage people to make sure they're taking care of themselves too. Being, mm. um, being compassionate to themselves. Because <laughs> um, you, you can't give from an empty cup. So, uh, uh, yeah. So remembering that, that as well. That's something that took me a long, long time to, to learn. And I'm very much still working on I think we're going to end it off there because you just, you ended it for me. <laughs> I think that's so important. It's very, very yeah. important. And like, I think I needed to hear that one again too. Well, Dr. Lamb, thank you so much for being a part of our series and on our series. It has been a pleasure chatting with you today. If our audience wants to learn more about you, where can they follow you? Or um, even if they want to search you up, to see where you're located and everything. Um, well, thank you for uh, the invitation and giving me the opportunity to nice. to do this um, and uh, and to chat with you. I, uh, unlike yourself, I don't have a social media presence yet. Uh, or I say yet, I'm not sure I will. But um, mm -hmm. so, yeah, I'm not really uh, findable there. Um, but your newsletter, the uh, yeah, so the my uh, the university, the university recently did a an article on our our clinic that you know we shared on the uh, uh, the adult facial difference group, and um, I think California or sorry, I always say that Children's Cranny Facial Association shared on their website, which I'm very grateful for, or mm -hmm. on their uh, social media accounts, and you shared it too, thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that recently came out, but if you search my name and, and Loma Linda, um, you'll come across our, uh, our team's, team's website and you can see all the different people involved with, uh, with the care of our patients. Um, but it, to learn more about our clinic, um, yeah, probably a quick, uh, a Google search. That's probably the best way. Or looking, yeah, if, if people are connected to the, Children's screening facial social media, they can probably find that article that, yeah. um, that you mentioned. Yeah. Yes, it's a good read. Please, please read it when you guys get a chance. I did, and that's why I reposted it. And it was really good. That was really such a good article. And Thank I'm you. so glad they did that. So glad. Yeah, the, person, the person who wrote it did a, I thought, did an excellent job. He did. They really did. And I remember I got so many responses like, oh my God, who is this? This is so cool. Yes, we're finally getting our flowers. Yes. I'm like, I know. <laughs> so cool. But again, thank you so much. We appreciate your sharing your time with us. And I look yeah, forward to chatting you. with you again in the future. Yeah, definitely. Thank yeah, you. I, I look forward to that too.